about the phrase, the sons of God? What about the ancient references, the, uh, the landmarks, the kind of day in which they lived, the patriarchal period, a pre-mosaic uh, type of period? All of that follows right through the whole book of Job. No, I'm not sure it does. What you have is a poet who is deliberately archaizing. I'm not saying that the two books grew up independently of each other. Well, you're saying he's deliberately deceiving then. No, of course not. Well, if he's deliberately presenting it as though it were a period in which it is not, I would say that would be deliberately deceiving. Certainly not. This is the way literature was written in the biblical period. Well, I, I think that Job is referred to even in the rest of the Old Testament as a historical character, not as a legend. Ezekiel refers to him as a very notable mm -hmm. person uh, that everyone knew along with Daniel and Noah. Right. Uh, and St. Paul refers to him similarly as the patience of Job. But after chapter... James. I'm sorry. sorry. After, after chapter 2, once you transfer from prose to poetry, Job stops being patient. Starting in chapter 3, he is a terribly impatient, outraged, angry, blaspheming Job. There is a, a total inversion of the, uh, of the characters there. And the friends who started out urging Job to, to be a little bit heretical, they become the defenders of conventional wisdom. Now, I think there are some real disjunctures between the, the prose framework and the poem well, in the middle. I think that's a disjuncture to say that Job started out praising God, and then later he turned exactly the opposite, because even in that middle section, he's still recognizing God's hand. Don't forget, Job is the one who uttered chapter 19, I know that my Redeemer liveth. He's the one who said in chapter 23, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. True, Job had some discouraging moments. You do, and I do. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean there's a total antithesis between these two sections. First of all, I, I know that my Redeemer liveth happens to be very obscure Hebrew. The Hebrew is not nearly as clear or as inspiring as the English, but all of this is really small details. The major point, Norm, is, is the concept of God presented in the speech from the whirlwind the same as the God presented in chapters 1, 2, and 42, that is a bargaining and compensating God. And I really don't see that he is. Well, I don't see that he's a bargaining yeah. God, but I do think that he is a compensating God because he did compensate Job in the end. And notice that in chapter 42, when he compensated Job, he gave him twice as many cattle, mm -hmm. twice as much silver, twice as much gold, but the same amount of children, mm -hmm. not twice as many. And I think the direct implication of that is he never lost the first ones. He will get them in the resurrection. And he affirmed his belief in the resurrection in chapter 19. So that shows that the God behind the scenes will bring about beyond the scenes what we can't understand on the scenes. Well, what you said in your book is what the book of Job is all about. Namely, that God wants people that will serve him because they love him, not because of what they'll get from him. Is that not the story of the book of Job? Even when the people don't have all the reasons... I think that's a very plausible interpretation. By the way, that's what Archibald McLeish says in his modern telling of Job and J.B., that the key to understanding God's role in tragedy is that the imperfection of the world makes it possible for us to love God, not because we are overwhelmed with his greatness, but because we are warmed by his goodness. I'm not sure that's the point of biblical Job. The biblical story of Job almost makes the opposite point, John. God appears in the whirlwind. God overwhelms Job. Frankly, I am more comfortable with a God who invites us to love him than with a God who intimidates us into apologizing and, and being afraid of him. I I don't think it's either a great God or a good God. I think if you look at Job in the total balance, you have a, a great God who is a good God. He's great. He's in sovereign control of the universe. Even Satan can't do anything without his permission. There are limits around Job. Satan complained because God had built a hedge around Job that Satan couldn't get into. He got in only because God permitted. You have a God who's in sovereign control of the entire universe, including the forces of evil throughout the entire book. But who is not simply all-powerful, and therefore we fearfully bow before him, but he's a God who's all-loving, and we willingly submit to him. And that's the message of the end of the book of Job. Norm, I could go along with that as long as we keep the focus on Job. Suppose someone chose to write a book not about Job, but about Job's children, and the story ended with their being killed. Where is the purification? Where is the sense of growth through misfortune when they are dead before you come to the end of chapter 1. I think the sense is that Job himself proclaimed that our hope does not end in the grave, that we have an all-powerful God who will be able to reverse death and bring a life beyond the grave that will rectify all of the injustices in this life. But as I read your book carefully, uh, you have held out no hope 
that there would be such a life beyond the grave. And as a consequence of that, I think your conclusion was a logical one from your premises. If there is no hope beyond the grave, then we are in this life, as the Apostle Paul said, most miserable because we can't figure out anything and we don't have any assurance that anything better is going to come. John, the only page reference I know by heart in my book is this one. It's on page 29 because I'm asked this question so often. It's not that I offer no hope. It's that I offer no confidence. There may, there may not be a life beyond this one. And because I can't be sure, I can't bet all my chips on the fact that there's another world where the injustices of this world will be straightened out. And because I can't, I have to work that much harder to try and minimize the amount of injustice in this world. What happens, I think, is that when Christian and Jewish preachers alike want to mobilize people for social action, for world peace, for racial justice, for economic justice, they tend to go back to the Hebrew Scriptures and to the prophets because they play down the world to come and its balancing effect, and they do focus on trying to make this world more nearly the kingdom of God, and I think I stand with them. Let me offer a, a suggestion on how that can be done. Usually it's argued if God is all-powerful, he could destroy evil. If he's all good, he would destroy evil, but evil isn't destroyed, therefore there is no such God. Well, I think you can turn that around and argue just the opposite. If he is all-powerful, he can do it. If he is all good, he will do it. And the fact that it's not yet done proves that he will one day do it. You can't stop the novel in the second chapter and say, this thing will never turn out. And you can't look at life right in the middle and say, there's no way for this to come out. If there is an all-good and all-powerful God, he not only can do it, he will do it, and that is your hope and assurance that it will be done. Yeah, this is the 92nd Psalm, that the, the wicked may flourish like the grass and the righteous are like the palm tree. That is, wickedness may have an apparent head start, but in the long run, God's justice catches up with it. Until you remember the words of John Maynard Keynes, and in the long run, we are all dead. But I wouldn't take the words of uh, Keynes over the authoritative words of Scripture. I would say in the long run, we're all going to be alive. And from my standpoint, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So I don't believe in the long run we're going to be dead. If I knew that in the long run we were going to be dead, I would have to know everything. If I knew everything, I would be God. So in order to know in the long run that it's not going to turn out, you'd have to be omniscient, so you'd have to be God in order to defeat God. Also, the evidence that it's true, let's put it the other way, not just the negative, but the fact that what you are saying is true is Christ's resurrection as the first fruit, as the proof of the fact of the hope that we have. John, I'll go back to the the question that you thought out to me two weeks ago. That's great for the committed Christian who's watching. What about the skeptic who's watching and says the resurrection of Jesus is hardly a fact it is at best a religious hypothesis, and I'm not impressed. What am I to make of all the suffering and all the oppression and all the unfairness of the world if I am skeptical about the resurrection? It's, it's a well, great question. I'd be glad to answer it, but the guy that's sitting next to you wrote three books on that very question, so why don't you answer it? <laughs> well, in brief, I would say read Rabbi Pincus Lepide's book. Here's a Jewish rabbi who has concluded that G- Jesus rose from the dead. Or read Frank Morrison's book, Who Moved the Stone? He was a skeptic who wanted to look in to the evidence about Christ in order to disprove it. The evidence was so overwhelming that he was converted and wrote a book showing how Christ did rise from the dead. Or read or Simon Greenleaf from Harvard Law School wrote the book on legal evidence. His student challenged him to apply the legal evidence to the New Testament documents to test their authenticity. He, too, was converted and became a Christian. The evidence is there, but you can lead a horse to the water, you can't make him drink. No, you're preaching to the choir. Uh, that is, these, these evidences will persuade the persuaded and strengthen the belief of those who are open to believing, and there is a real purpose to doing that. Well, then you missed the point I made, because in each of those cases, it was someone who was unpersuaded that the evidence was presented to. Simon Greenleaf was unpersuaded. Uh, Frank Morrison was unpersuaded. Uh, Pincus Lepied was unpersuaded. They became persuaded by the evidence. I'm saying that the cart and the horse is evidence first and then persuasion. But Harold Kushner has also read the New Testament and taught it at the college level and has some familiarity with it. And I'm still unpersuaded. Well, I'm, I'm not saying you're not unpersuaded. I'm just saying that there is objective evidence there for anyone who wishes to look into it and that as a, as a Christian and numerous other people who have looked at the evidence even when they weren't, they found it sufficient to make a commitment without saying, I leap before I look. They took a look and then they placed their faith in the sufficiency of the evidence rather than a blind leap of faith. Does that make sense? 
it describes the situation, I don't think it's going to convert any of the unconverted. Well, I, I don't think it's necessarily going to convert. I think there's a difference between proof and persuasion. Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between objective evidence and a subjective decision. I mean, I know a lot of people who are persuaded that airplanes are the most efficient form of transportation, but they won't get on an airplane and go anywhere. So it's a difference between belief that and belief in. Right. All I'm saying is that there's plenty of evidence for anyone who wants to believe that. He's going to have to make his own free choice as to whether he wants to believe in it. We're going to start with some questions from our audience. And our uh, first question is right here. Well, my uh, question goes to Mr. Kushner. In the title of your book, uh, you use the terminology when bad things happen to good people. And then you went on in your discussion to call those good people really innocent people. You feel that bad things happen to innocent people. My question is, who indeed is innocent uh, before God? Uh, do you consider yourself a good person and thereby innocent uh, before God from having any bad thing happen? In a brief answer, yes. That is, I am constantly seeing people who are subjected to fates they don't deserve. I'm not concerned about their innocence. I'm not concerned about their freedom from the taint of sin. I'm concerned about a sense of proportionality and justice. I think a child who is born handicapped or retarded is an innocent person, whatever your theology or mine about inherited original sin may be. I think a person who tries to be a good husband, good father, good neighbor, and is struck down by a drunk driver is a good person in the sense that he didn't deserve all these things happening to him. That's what I had in mind when I titled my book as I did. Okay. Uh, can I pick up on that sure. in terms of, uh, I think that, uh, Dr. Geisler, correct me if I'm wrong, that Christianity would hold that, yes, that innocent people are innocent when they do suffer. For example, Jesus Christ himself suffered. Therefore, we would not say he was guilty. He deserved it. All right? So, and I think that that is also the message of the book of Job, going back to that, is that, uh, yes, that uh, God wants us to love him for himself, not for what we get out of him. And that includes the fact that there are times when we don't understand all of his ways. Uh, Dr. Geisler, maybe you'd like to add something not only to that, but also this fact of where this question was coming from concerning are all people innocent? Well, let's just take it on an Old Testament basis. I think uh, Psalm 51 says, I was born in sin, sin did my mother conceive me. Prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17 said, that man, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, Moses said in Genesis 6-5 that every thought of the imagination of the heart was only evil continually. I think you can challenge the thesis, even from the Old Testament, that man is basically innocent and basically good. I think that since the fall, man is evil, and that, uh, in a sense, we deserve far worse than we get. Now, I can empathize with the tragedies that happen in life, but I think in the light of a just God, in the light of uh, rebellious human beings, in the light of the Old Testament verses on the depravity of man, we have to be very careful in saying that man is good and therefore didn't deserve anything. Man is basically evil and deserves more uh, than he gets, and uh, we can be thankful to a gracious God that he doesn't give us more uh, than we actually get. Shakespeare says something like that in Hamlet. If everyone got his just desserts, who would escape a whipping? But, Norm, I think you should have quit when you were ahead. I think that the... This kind of uh, view of man, first, I don't believe is scripturally valid, at least in terms of the Hebrew Bible, and even if it is, I think misrepresents the kind of religion which you and I have been sharing for all the weeks we've been talking. It seems to me that if the Hebrew Scripture were to make a major statement about the nature of man, it would not tuck it into a single verse in the psalm. Of all the books of the Bible... The Psalms, more than any, much as I love them, represent human beings talking to God rather than God talking to Israel or to the human race. It seems to me that what you get from the Hebrew Scriptures is not a story of the depravity of man, but of the weakness of man with a great deal of sympathy along with the impatience. Beyond that, anyone who has served as a pastor in a congregation will have seen, perhaps not theologically, innocent, perfect people, but certainly good and well-meaning people who don't deserve what they have been getting. One has to simply walk down the corridor of a hospital and see that there is undeserved suffering disproportionate to what has gone on, and it seems to me it is, even, even if one were to try and demonstrate that it's theologically acceptable, it seems to me morally unacceptable to answer 
the terminally ill cancer patient who groans, why am I suffering, by saying, because your mother conceived you in sin? Well, first of all, I don't think we can quite that smoothly uh, push away all those verses of Scripture. I quoted from the Psalms. Mm -hmm. I quoted from the Prophets. I quoted from the Torah. I quoted from throughout the Old Testament. You can also add to it the book of Ecclesiastes. There's not a just man upon the earth that does good and sins not. I think that what we have is a picture throughout the entire Old Testament of a God who looks down on a creation that he made perfect, that he gave freedom to, that they rebelled, and as a consequence, sin and death and judgment came in. And yet in his mercy, he saves us from everything we do deserve. Someone said grace is giving us what we don't deserve, and mercy is saving us from what we did deserve. And surely, in a basic sense of the Old Testament Scripture, man is sinful. He deserves the judgment of God, but God is gracious and overflowed in his love and saved us from the judgment uh, we deserve. So rather than calling man good, I'd rather follow the Hebrew Scriptures and uh, recognize that man is evil. I just don't find that in Hebrew scriptures. Not nearly as strongly and as unequivocally as you. What would you do with all those verses I just quoted? All those verses? What? I One found verse them in out of 150? No, no, no. I found all those verses in the Hebrew scripture. Genesis 6, 5, right. uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, Psalm 51, uh, Jeremiah 17. No, I could go on and on. lines. Four lines out of 22 books? Well, give me... That is a theological doctrine. Give me one verse that says, just one, that says that man is intrinsically uh, good and not fallen. Well, it never says he's fallen. It says he's rebellious. It says he's always doing wrong things. But you see, for the Jewish concept of man, sin is an event, not a condition. One sins, but one does not become a sinner thereby. One is simply an imperfect man. But where does it say that 100 is the minimum passing grade? Yeah, we all do wrong things. But there is, I think, an emphasis in Hebrew Scripture, which is different in Christianity, I will certainly acknowledge. An emphasis that says, if you put your mind to it, you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. I didn't quote Christian Scripture, I quoted Jewish Scripture, and I'm asking you to give me one verse from Jewish Scripture that says that man is intrinsically good and not sinful and not fallen. I think Genesis 1 about let us make man in our image. That was before he fell. But it's still the nature of man. I know, but I'm talking about after... But you see, I don't, I don't see Genesis 3 as a fall. We were through this a couple of weeks ago. I think the Psalms, for example, are suffused with a sense of human beings who are basically good, basically God-fearing, feel that they have reason to be in God's good graces, and are always saying, how long, O Lord, will you torment us like this? But why, is, why are the psalmists constantly crying out because of their enemies, those that hate them, those that are judging them, asking for vindication? If man is so intrinsically good, why are the psalms filled with all these prayers for deliverance and uh, imprecations and uh, uh, enemies? Uh, I don't see that throughout because the Because it's the psalmists who are good and who are being picked on by unscrupulous enemies. But if they deserve it, why are they crying out to God? The question is not whether they deserve it. The question is whether man is evil as reflected in the Psalms. And I see the psalmist confessing his own sin. In fact, in Psalm 19, uh, David uh, cried out and said, uh, who can understand his errors? God, you said in your book that God has flaws, that God is imperfect. David prayed uh, that he would be cleansed of his errors, not that he would recognize errors in God. When he said, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Of course, one of the purposes of religion is to make human beings better. But I think you are misinterpreting Hebrew scripture when you see them as picturing man as evil. They picture man as imperfect. Imperfect is not necessarily the same as evil. I'd be glad to be corrected from Hebrew scriptures, but I've yet to hear a verse uh, that says that man is intrinsically good after Genesis 3 when he uh, took the forbidden fruit and disobeyed God. Uh, offerings as well as the sacrifice itself. Uh, it seemed like that it's heavy on that uh, there's another verse that pops into my mind. Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? Jeremiah, right. Okay, but no, these passages... That... Well, wait a minute, John. What, uh, what do you mean when you ask about the sacrifices in Leviticus? It seems to me that it's uh, comprehensive that nobody was excluded. From sacrifices? That's right. But sacrifices are to express joy and gratitude and not only to atone for sin. But according to the Pentateuch, some of those things, it was for specific sin. Right, and some of them were specific occasions of gratitude. Sacrifices were gifts to God. Sac the Hebrew term korban, that which brings you close to God. I come back and I would, I would say that that I agree with, but I cannot let you off the hook from saying that it seems like everybody is included concerning sin. I find no place where it's excluded, do you? 
Well, I'm not sure. Again, I go back to what I said before, that sin is an event and not a condition. The fact that everybody may break a law doesn't mean that everybody is a criminal. Yeah. There, there are people who will double park, and there are people who will speed, and there are people who will mail letters without stamps, and there are people who will get their deductions wrong on their income tax. They are not criminals. They are simply imperfect. And this, it seems to me, is the Hebrew scriptural mentality in Leviticus. You have rules about how to offer an atonement sacrifice because people are going to be imperfect. Not because everybody is a sinner, but because nobody is going to get through life without ever making a mistake. We're bypassing for the moment whether we're sinners because uh, we sin or whether we sin because we're sinners. Uh, is it not possible that there is a condition in man that prompts sin and it's not an either or, either sure. a condition or an activity? Couldn't sin be an act proceeding from a condition which was less than perfect uh, as a consequence of Adam's sin? Absolutely. But that doesn't disqualify people any more than a baseball player is considered a failure if he uh, flies out two times out of three. is considered a tremendous success. The passing rate is well short of 100. God understands that people are weak, imperfect, easily distracted, selfish, uh, led by all sorts of appetites, but that does not make them bad people, and I think it does not justify saying that when they get cancer or when they are struck down by heart attacks, it's because they are sinners to begin with and, and God is administering well, justice. Well, let's distinguish two kinds of evil. Uh, Jesus once said, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, so it's pretty obvious that even people described as evil can do good things. That's not the question. Obviously, people who are evil by nature could do good things. Right. The question is whether the Old Testament describes them as being evil by nature and as evil springing from their very hearts, from their very birth. The psalmist also said the wicked go astray from the womb speaking lies. That's not an isolated passage along with uh, chapter 51. I was born in sin and sin did my mother conceive me in the Genesis 3 and all those other passages. I see a vertical evil in the Old Testament. I think that's what you're failing to take into account. A rebellion of the heart against God. Sure, a person who's rebelling against God can love his wife and do good to his children. But why is it that we should call man intrinsically good when he's intrinsically a rebel vertically against God? No, I'm sorry. I think those are isolated verses. I don't think that Hebrew scripture makes major theological pronouncements a word here and a word here. Uh, it is not systematically theological at all. It tells a story. It tells a story of an Israelite people who are very often backsliding and stubborn, but still worthy of being objects of God's affection, who are struggling upwards, who are trying to create a more decent society than the pagan worlds around them, who have a higher standard of justice and sensitivity than anything the world had previously seen. It does not say they are perfect. They don't have to be perfect. Let me ask you this. You said the Hebrew scriptures do not make major pronouncement concerning the condition of man as being sinful. Does it make a major pronouncement concerning man as being intrinsically good? No, because it's not a theological book. It's a book about life. Well, I would say that uh, there's no difference between those two. A theological book can be a book about life. Why do you have to bifurcate the two? Because it is simply not given to make a theological pronouncement. Theology is not a Jewish metier. Well, the the ultra, forget about the yeah. word theology. Does it tell us truth about life as God gives it, whatever you want to call it? Yes, I believe it does, but okay. I believe that that truth arises from the comprehensive narrative picture in its context and not from isolated proof text. But is that comprehensive narrative picture, such as I quoted a whole comprehensive right. picture of those verses, no, you didn't. that man you is in rebellion against God? Verses. Well, they're isolated verses, but they're not out of context, and they're throughout the entire Old Testament. Can you give me a series of verses uh, or truths throughout the Old Testament that says that man is intrinsically not in rebellion against God? No, all I can give you is a volume of 22 books in Hebrew which paint a picture of a people who are sometimes weak and rebellious and sometimes faithful and inspiring. But isn't that same picture from that volume of the 22 or 24 books, yeah. depending on how you uh, count them, uh, a picture of a rebellious people who is a consequence of uh, Adam's uh, sin are with a propensity and a continual practice of sin and are constantly in rebellion against God and need atonement? Not as I read it.
Well, what was the whole atonement for? What atonement? The, the day of atonement, the uh, uh, sacrifice. For imperfection, for the fact that we're not perfect, not but, that we're terrible sinners, but Leviticus, not that we're fallen. But uh, Leviticus uh, clearly says that this was for the sins of the people. Right, the imperfections, the fact that they haven't been perfect. But that's uh, Not sin. for the sinfulness of the people, but for the individual deeds of sin. Their sins follow from the fact that they can sin, don't Of course, they? yeah, that they're not perfect. And the atonement was given for these sins. Now, how do you say they're a, a good people when constantly they had to offer sacrifice for their continual sins? Because they're good people, but not perfect. If they weren't good people, why would they be trying to atone? Why wouldn't they simply wallow in their sinfulness the way the Canaanites did? The fact that they are willing to follow God's direction doesn't mean that they didn't sin. I mean, the fact that I'm willing to confess my sin is one thing, but the fact that I continually sin is another thing, and I'm talking about the latter. Doesn't the Old Testament paint a picture of a people who are continually sinning, continually rebelling, continually worshiping idols, continually uh, putting something else first over than the, the one and true God? Sure, in the same way that the newspaper is full of wars and murders and automobile accidents, this is not where life is lived. In the same way that the law codes deal with crimes and not with people being faithful and law-abiding. Because it is the nature of law codes to talk about the extraordinary, and it is the nature of newspapers to report the extraordinary. And the parts of Scripture which are law codes talk about misdeeds, and the parts of Scripture which are, for example, the book of Judges, talk about misdeeds because normal life is dull. I mean, you have a verse in the book of Judges, for example, and the land was quiet for 40 years. That's 40 years without worshiping idols. And then after the 40 years, they start to backslide. And because war and oppression and God sending a redeemer is much more interesting copy than the land being peaceful for 40 years, it gets a disproportionate amount of ink in the Bible. Just as crimes and wars get a disproportionate amount of coverage in the newspaper. You will never see a newspaper article saying, plane land safely at local airport. You will only see an article that says plane crashes. Not because planes crash all the time. Not because airplanes are unsafe, but because when a plane crashes, it is dramatic news. Well, you make interesting uh, comment there, but I don't think that represents the Old Testament, because one thing that distinguishes the Old Testament from a normal uh, newspaper account is the Old Testament says the good along with the bad. It'll tell the great things about people as well as the bad things, but in spite of the fact that it gives a balanced picture, it still presents man as in continual rebellion against God, manifest in different ways, internally and externally, but perpetually and by inclination, and uh, you seem to admit this and yet want to say that man is somehow intrinsically good. I don't understand how you can have both. Point number one. You're not simply arguing with me, you are arguing with 3,000 years of Jewish understanding of the Bible, which says that human beings are not bad because they're not perfect. That Abraham and David and all these wonderful patriarchs were not perfect, but they were still darn good people. Secondly, and this goes back to the question which started this whole uh, involvement, when people are hurt in life, my pastoral experience is that frequently they suffer out of all possible proportion to their sinfulness. That they are not perfect is no justification for what people have to go through, let alone the question of proportionality that the, you know, if, if imperfect people are going to be struck down, why aren't the most imperfect struck down most dramatically? I think it's that which I had in mind when I said that innocent people suffer. It's not a juridical concept of innocence. It's a sense of disproportionality. Well, I understand the horizontal thing that you have in mind but I'm not quite sure you understand the vertical thing I have in mind. I do understand that. I'm, I'm just talking about by it. I'm talking about the Old Testament presenting mm -hmm. a picture of man in continual vertical rebellion mm -hmm. against God right. for which he is accountable before God mm -hmm. and for which sacrifices are necessary to atone mm -hmm. for sin. Do you see that picture in the Old Testament? Of course I see it. But that does not brand man as hopelessly sinful. Well, I would think it's hopelessly sinful if he can't do anything for himself and God has to provide a lamb, a lamb as a sacrifice that man is hopeless in himself unless God provides graciously for his salvation. Right. That is the Christian overlay on Hebrew Scriptures. I recognize it. Well, I don't think it's the Christian overlay. I, I wasn't referring to anything Christian. I'm referring simply to the Old Testament Scriptures themselves. Did God not provide sacrificial lambs for the sins of the people? Did he not provide a day of atonement for the whole nation? Was, was there not a continual sacrificial system for their continual sins? 
<laughs> regardless of whether Christ fulfilled this, which yeah. is a Christian concept, mm -hmm. don't you see even that in the Old Testament? That God provided the lambs only in the sense that he created all living creatures. The people brought the lambs. The but people were they brought the lambs to provided for sin? Sometimes for sin and sometimes for joy and sometimes for the birth of a child and sometimes for a good harvest. The lamb was sometimes provided for joy? Sure. Uh, there were thank offerings, but mm -hmm. it was not the lamb that was a thank offering. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, for example, in a space of seven days you would offer 70 rams, right? They were not atonement. They were celebration. They were gratitude. Well, but uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was a feast of thanksgiving, but are you saying that the sacrifices that were offered there were not for sin? That's precisely what I'm saying. Where does it say that in the Scripture? Try the book of Numbers, well, chapter 28. Well, give me the, the concept or the verse, or what is it? It says, you shall rejoice on this holiday, and you shall bring these, the, what's known as the Korban Todon, or the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And it's 14 lambs one day, and 13 lambs the next day, and 12 lambs the next. This is not atonement for sin. This is sheer expression of joy. The way, for example, when a person marries off a daughter, he will invite his friends and relatives to a big dinner, and many more than 14 lambs will be slaughtered to fill their place. And are you saying that's the same thing that the, the lamb and the Passover was uh, a thanksgiving instead of atonement? From the lamb's point of view, it's the same thing. No, from I'm not talking year. about that. I'm talking about from God's point of view and man's point of view. No, God... from man's point of view, it's totally different. From man's point of view, an offering in celebration and gratitude is psychologically 180 degrees different. The lamb wasn't atonement. given to atone for sin? The Paschal Lamb was. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Sure. So the fact that uh, there were offerings on other occasions that were mm -hmm. thank offerings does not negate the fact that there were continual offerings for continual sins. Right. And well, there were, yeah, or repeated But if sins. you say that, then I can't understand how you can say that man is not continually a sinner and that he's essentially good. Because a person who is imperfect is not continually a sinner. He's just less than perfect. Yeah, but less than perfect is sinful, is it not? No. I am less judgmental than you, and I believe God is. But if God's standard uh, is X, and I do less than X, am I not falling short of God's standard? Absolutely. All and we have to do then is define what X is. But if I fall short of God's standard, then I've sinned, have I not? Sure. I just don't know what God's standards are. Well, hasn't he revealed them in the Old Testament? Isn't, for yes. example, Exodus 20 God's standard? Yes, but I'm not totally sure that 95% is a failing grade. Yes, but don't a hundred percent of the people at one time or another mm -hmm. fall short of the standard of God revealed in Exodus 20 called the Ten Commandments? That is, no. is there anyone who ever lived who perfectly kept all the Ten Commandments? Hey, watch it now. The Ten Commandments are a giveaway. The Ten Commandments are simply a way of staying out of jail. Yeah, there are tens of millions of people who never murder and never commit adultery and never steal. And never and have any false gods and never sure. uh, lie. There are tens of millions of people who have never committed broken any one of the Ten Commandments. I believe that. I would like to meet one. I hope you will. <laughs> I, I hope I do, too. What? People... Because the, the uh, psalmist uh, said clearly in Psalm 14 that they've all uh, sinned. In Isaiah chapter 53, we've all gone astray. Well, I'm just uh, simply trying to point out that in uh, Psalm 14 and in Isaiah 53, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own ways. And that's why the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And uh, to say that it's not true in the Old Testament that people didn't continually sin seems to me to negate what the prophet said. How does this relate to our topic of the problem of evil or suffering? Because the basic thesis of Rabbi Kushner's book is that uh, bad things happen to good people. And I think that people are not intrinsically good. They're intrinsically evil and sinful and need sacrifices. And therefore, the whole thesis of the book collapses if you deny the fact that man's intrinsically good. And at the same time, I don't think that you're saying that's the only reason that there is suffering and evil. By no means. But it seems to me that God is gracious in not giving us more uh, judgment, that he's merciful in delivering us from more conflict. And we're going to begin with questions again concerning this topic. And uh, what is your question? Yes, this is to the rabbi. In one uh, broadcast, you mentioned that God's enemy is man's unresponsiveness. Now, you've given two examples over the, the shows. One, uh, the death of a young son might bring outrage, uh, anger, etc. Another example you gave was uh, one that uh, these parents of a de of maybe their son or daughter died, and then they would uh, be uplifted. Maybe it, maybe it would help their marriage. Maybe it would help their community. Now, those are two opposite responses. They're not unresponsiveness. It's, it's response. Now, what I want to ask is this. Uh, in light of that, uh, 
what response do you think God requires or wants or uh, or what do you, would you like to see in an individual? And if that is uh, a positive response, then what makes the negative response wrong? And especially in light of this unresponsiveness. Okay, let me distinguish between a couple of things. One is the response of people in the face of misfortune and tragedy, where I would hope they would find in their faith and in the presence of God the strength and the faith to survive tragedy, to keep on living and to affirm the worthwhileness of life even when life has been so cruel to them. The only thing you can do for a person you loved who has died is turn their death into an impulse for affirming life not an impulse for denying it. That's the response I would like to see people come up with when they have been struck by misfortune. When I said several shows back that from the Hebrew point of view, the enemy of God, the obstacle to God's kingdom is not Satan, but human unresponsiveness, it wasn't that situation I had in mind. I mean the kind of unresponsiveness that says because it is easier to steal than to work, I will steal. Because it's easier to tell a lie than to face the truth, I will tell a lie. That there is a kind of a moral law of gravity which pulls us down and tempts us to sleep late and eat too much and drink too much and take things that don't belong to us and take the lazy way out. That's the kind of human unresponsiveness to God's challenge, which is the source of moral evil in the world. Not natural evil, but moral evil. Is it not an easier response when there's a death of a young son to be angry and bitter rather than take that as an impulse to be better? Absolutely. The hard thing is to somehow take all of the white heat of your rage and channel it into something which will warm somebody else's life. That's the much more creative response. Self-pity, feeling sorry for yourself, jealousy, bitterness, unresolved anger, yeah, I think it's a lot easier to leave things there. And that's why religion really has to prod people to take the harder route. Okay, so you want to respond to that at all? No, I agree that uh, the response that God desires is a positive response. He wants us to make it a stepping stone, not a stumbling stone. Uh, the only thing I think we probably disagree on is that I think that in doing that, that it's an all-powerful God who provides us the strength to do it because, frankly, in my own fallen, depraved, sinful state as a rebel against God, I don't have the desire and the ability to accomplish that apart from His grace, and so I'm glad that there is a gracious, all-powerful God who gives me the motivation and the strength to do that. I would agree with every word of that except one half of one. I would say an awfully powerful God an awesomely powerful God. It doesn't have to be all-powerful to do that, but we've been through that before. Do you have a biblical uh, basis for saying that God is limited, or is that just your own reaction to uh, the situation of evil as you see it? A couple of things. I don't have a verse, because I, I don't turn to the Bible for proof texts. I turn to it for the whole world. I think there are hints that sometimes God's power is, in fact, finite. One of my favorite ones, there is no book in all of Scripture that repeats the idea that the good are rewarded and the bad are punished as much as the book of Deuteronomy. And yet in Deuteronomy you have this very fascinating passage which says when the Israelites go to war, the high priest is supposed to say, if there's any man here who has affianced a woman and not wed her, who has built a house and not moved into it, who has cultivated a vineyard and not tasted its wine, let him go home lest he die in battle. Now, if you believe that God is in charge, if you believe that God controls everything that happens, the high priest ought to take the new bridegrooms and the new homeowners and the vineyard owners, put them up on the front lines and depend on God to keep them safe. If you believe that nothing tragic happens in the world unless it serves God's purposes, why do you have to send those people home whose death would be tragic? Why can't you count on God to keep it safe? That's one dimension of proof. The other is simply that on every page of the Hebrew Scriptures, the text shouts out to me that God stands for justice and morality. And therefore, when I see something which, to my biblically educated soul, is unjust and immoral, I cannot attribute that to God. I have to find the origin, the roots of that elsewhere. Well, I agree that uh, the entire text shouts out for God's justice, but what you need to do is show that the entire text shouts out for God's finitude, and you haven't done that. You uh, objected to proof text, in which you gave one isolated proof text of a view in which the entire text shouts out to the contrary, that I'm the sovereign God who created heaven and earth, that I can supernaturally intervene and deliver uh, people, that I am sovereign and no plan of mine can be thwarted as the book of Job. I think the entire text shouts out for God's all-powerfulness, not against it. I think where I differ from the question which the gentleman posed is, 
I don't want to be painted theologically into a corner where I have to perform an act of emotional dishonesty, where if a child or a parent or a wife or a brother dies, for me to say, isn't that wonderful they have graduated to be with God, I would when I don't that feel too. that it's I wonderful. I think Dr. Geisler would yeah. as well. I think okay. Paul, that's, that's really what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, if that were the only basis for it, I think we'd all agree again with Freud that it would be simply an illusion. But what if God revealed that in his presence is, full, is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore, as he did in Psalm 16? What if God revealed, as he did in the Old Testament, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saint? Then it seems to me that he has revealed to us that there is a life and there is joy beyond the grave, and there's no reason we should deny ourselves of that joy in the light of the tragedy of life. We should encourage ourselves with that joy. Norman, are you happy when somebody you love dies? I am not happy with how they died, but I certainly am delighted with where they went. And I think we have to distinguish in the way in which someone dies and the destiny to which they go when they die. With okay, the fact can, also of freedom being involved in that. that I could discussion. be happy with where. I'm a little uncomfortable with when. I mean, couldn't they have received their promotion 30 years later? I'm, I'm uncomfortable with when, too, but my discomfort is not a proof that their death was unjustifiable, particularly if there is a God who plans the end from the beginning, uh, who has our best interest at heart, and who has the power to bring it about. Okay, I think we're really getting down to one of the fundamental divergences between your view and mine. My sense is the theological promise of an afterlife is simply not substantial enough to counterbalance the pain of a tragic death in this world. But if there were an afterlife, as you said, I think, on a previous program, and if there were a reward for good and there were a punishment for evil, that would indeed solve the problem for you. It's just that you have doubts as to whether there is one. And I have some very sincere pain in confronting what goes on in this world. And it would have to be quite a balancing act to make up for all that pain. All right, let's... To guys one of your books, you said that this is the best possible way. This world is the best possible way to the best possible world. And uh, yet, uh, Rabbi Kushner is pushing you for some hard, concrete evidence that that is not just wishful thinking. I think uh, he's pointed out about uh, some of the authors that have painted the same scenario that we find in the book of Job and others, that nobody can see this, uh, this plan. Nobody can see this broad picture. Nobody's got proof that it's actually even there. What's the proof? I think the proof is uh, the history uh, of the Jewish people in the Old Testament and the incarnation of Christ in the New Testament. If you look at the history of the Jewish people, the tragic history, the suffering they went through in Egypt, the deliverance of God, the miraculous deliverance, the declaration that he's a God who created heaven and earth, that he can supernaturally intervene, that he gave prophets messages hundreds of years in advance that were fulfilled literally, and then we come to the New Testament that Jesus Christ fulfilled these, claimed to be the sinless Son of God, proved it by the resurrection from the dead, which was witnessed by over 500 people. We have over 5,000 5, documents supporting that New Testament uh, claim, and dozens of people who have looked into it have been uh, converted. It's open for anyone else who wants to look into it. But you don't accept that evidence. No, I don't. It's, uh, Would you admit that it's some evidence? I think for the person who wants to be persuaded, it's more than ample to persuade him that he's not simply uh, engaged in wishful thinking. Let me ask so you that. If you, if skeptical, you, I think excuse me, if you say that, if you yeah. say that, let's stop right where, where you're at. If somebody says Moses didn't live, mm -hmm. is there any evidence of the fact that Moses lived? Uh, you mean, do we have an autographed picture of him? No, we don't. Do we have any evidence? No. It, does it make any difference whether so a man... Moses is an imaginary figure. No, wait a minute. The, the joke we used to say in seminary is that there was never such a person as Moses. The Bible is written by somebody else by the same name. <laughs> that is, we don't have proof of Moses. What we have is a book, a book which is attributed to him. It is not the authorship which makes that book a religious lodestone. It is the contents. It is the truth. It is the, the pulsating vision of the book, whether Moses wrote it or somebody else by the same name wrote it. It doesn't matter whether he lived. What matters is okay. that whoever put this book together, whoever caught inspiration in a bottle and wrote it down black on white, has taught us something about how we should live, not how they lived. Can I make a comment to that, Norman? Well, yes, we have more evidence that and Moses lived than perhaps any figure from the ancient world. 
He's referred to in more books by more people of historical nature and virtually throughout the whole rest of the Old Testament. He's the central figure of their deliverance. If Moses didn't live, then we don't know that Caesar crossed the Rubicon. And the same thing is true in the New Testament. There's more New Testament documentary, historical witness that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose from the dead than any event from the ancient history recorded in that time period. So if you can't believe that, then you can't believe anything. Where I was going with the question was that... uh, at that warm uh, religious school called Evangelical, or the Chicago, University of Chicago uh, Theological Seminary, they helped put out uh, what you find in the religious uh, section of the Encyclopedia Britannica. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, there are more words listed to a certain person in the Encyclopedia Britannica, which I don't feel is a religious document, than anybody else in history. That person happens to be Jesus Christ. My question is, why would those folks put all of that information into a non-religious book concerning a person if it wasn't evidence that he actually lived. There's never been a philosopher, a skeptic, that has ever said in their history of the first hundred years A.D. that Jesus didn't live. John, I don't see what that proves. That all there that is proves. a person called Jesus that did live, which is evidence concerning the fact of a future life. Negative. John, all that proves is that the Encyclopedia Britannica was printed in a Christian society. All it proves is that Jesus is a very important figure for people in the English-speaking world. It doesn't prove that he existed. Are you saying he didn't exist? I'm saying I have absolutely no way of knowing whether he did or not. My own theory is that he probably did exist as a Jewish teacher of the first century and not as an incarnation of God. I mean, any more than you and I are incarnations of God. Is the New Testament a reliable record of his life? I think the New Testament is a partisan document. That is, we're, we're going through an election campaign in which people say some very strong things about what American life has been like in the last few years. Their statements are accurate, but their statements are tendentious. They are partisan. The New Testament was written by people who are pleading a cause that may have moved them to leave out certain information, certainly moved them to defame the Pharisees who deserve a much, much better fate than they receive in the New Testament. The New Testament is a hatchet job on the Pharisees. From that point of view, it is completely historically unreliable because it is a political, tendentious document. Whether it's accurate in other aspects, I don't know. The fact that the New Testament says Jesus fulfilled certain prophecies is not proof that he fulfilled them. It's only proof that somebody wrote that he did. So the New Testament's not a reliable document. No, I'm saying I have no way of knowing whether it's reliable or not. Well, I don't even know if it wasn't history. reliable with regard to with the, the Pharisees. Regard to the Pharisees. So you do but, know. It's, well, it's, it's not perfect. Yes. And well, you do know it's least, unreliable. With in at least Pharisees. one area where I have some independent knowledge, it is pretty strongly unreliable. And it would be reasonable to assume that it might be unreliable mm-hmm. in other areas, too. That's correct. Uh, well, let me just share that if that's the case then we can't trust anything from the ancient world because there's more documentary evidence closer to the original with more people and more eyewitnesses that have been verified for those documents than any event from the ancient world. The gap between the original record and the first books is less than 100 years. It's 1,000 years for others. The number of copies is about a dozen for the others. We have 5,000 for the New Testament. The number of witnesses of the resurrection of Christ alone, over 500 direct witnesses. We don't even have direct eyewitnesses for Tacitus, Thucydides, Herodotus, other books. So if you throw out the New Testament as a reliable document, you just thrown out all of ancient history as reliable. First of all, Norm, I can sleep perfectly well tonight having discarded the New Testament as a reliable guide to history. Secondly, that you have witnesses close to the event, especially in the ancient world, is not persuasive to me. There are people who fought in World War II in whose lifetime there are already legends about what happened in battles in which they took place, which are inaccurate. Uh, John Bright, the, uh, the biblical historian in his volume, The History of Israel, tells a story of growing up in Virginia where a civil war battle had taken place where there was a certain legend about how the site of the battle got its name, which everybody knew was false. But within the lifetime of people who had taken part in that battle, the legend was circulating. It's very plausible that, for whatever reasons, people told stories 
which may or may not have happened, but which they hoped had happened, which see, they wished to happen. what you just said, Harold, is a proof of the very point I'm making. The only reason they knew those were legends is because there were eyewitnesses who could correct them. Mm -hmm. Now, the New Testament was written by those eyewitnesses. Therefore, the very point you're making substantiates the accuracy of the New Testament. No, because there were other people who are contemporaries of the authors of the New Testament who denied the fact that Jesus was an incarnation of God and rose from the dead. But there were no uh, people who were contemporary eyewitnesses of the events who lived with Christ day and night for three and a half years who saw the events who said that there were people who recorded it on the basis of second-hand information. Even Josephus, however, admitted that the immediate disciples of Christ believed that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Sure. He was not an oh, eyewitness that did prove it. I admit that they believe okay, it. Okay, if the immediate eyewitnesses did it, and if the eyewitnesses are the key to correcting legends, then you should use that eyewitness testimony to correct that legend that Jesus didn't really live and die. But how is somebody an eyewitness to a non-event? How can somebody come forward and say, I was there and there was no resurrection? Well, how can you testify to something that didn't happen? You could produce the body of Jesus. They never found the body. They found an empty tomb. You could produce how do you know they found an empty tomb? Because it's still empty. And because, oh, still empty. and because the eyewitnesses from the first century on testified to being empty, and because the authorities in the first century who wanted very much to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, who had the tomb sealed and had their guards there, could have easily produced the body had there been a body. But the only testimony to that is a Christian document itself. That's like the joke we used to tell in seminary, that in biblical days they had transistor radios because we haven't found any electric sockets. Doesn't make the document unreliable because it's a Christian document any more than it would make it unreliable reliable if it were a Jewish document. Well, it would be reliable if it's an eyewitness document cross-checked by many eyewitnesses that is contemporary of the events, and that's what we have. No, but by definition, all the people who affirm the resurrection are believers, and all the people who deny it are non-believers. They weren't always. Many more, and there are many more non-believers than believers. Was Thomas a believer? Was James a believer? Uh, there were several people who weren't believers who were convinced by meeting Christ, and besides that, simply because one believes that he saw a murder occur doesn't make him an unreliable witness to testify on behalf of seeing the murder. No, but somebody who has an emotional vested interest in convicting somebody, I think his testimony is suspicious. But you're assuming that those people had an emotional vested interest. The record says the exact contrary. It says they wanted to disbelieve it. They had to be convinced. Thomas had to put his finger in his hand, his hand in his side. Some of them were skeptics. They did not have that emotional vested interest. Again, the only testimony that any of that happened, the only testimony that Thomas did that, comes from the documentary of people who are trying to affirm the resurrection. But see, that's like saying in a witness at a trial, now apart from these five eyewitnesses, uh, you have a very poor case. Of course we have a very poor case if we eliminate all the eyewitnesses. <laughs> no, but what about, the, what about the, the attorney who says, apart from these five eyewitnesses, we have 20,000 eyewitnesses who said that it, they never saw any evidence. Well, if you can produce 20,000 eyewitnesses uh, who never saw any evidence in the New Testament, then you just converted me. Okay, what about the rabbis in the Talmud who were contemporaries, who lived in the same country at the same time, and regard Jesus as a well-intentioned Jewish man who was put to death by the Romans, were there, were in Jerusalem that Passover and didn't see a resurrected Jesus. The, the question is not whether somebody didn't see a murder. The question is whether somebody did see it. You don't convict somebody because somebody wasn't there to see the murder. You convict them because there were people there who saw the murder. That's a strange twist of logic. But if, if he came to life again, why was this not persuasive to hundreds of thousands of people? It who exactly were was. There were 3,000 people converted within a month in the very city in which it happened, and then thousands... No, 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 I'm sorry, Norm. There is a Christian document which says there were 3,000 people converted. And there is a man named Ramsey who spent 20 years of his life uh, researching the man who wrote that document and his other book who concluded he was a first-rate historian. He made not one single mistake. Have you read St. Paul, a traveler and Roman citizen? And he was not a scholar that was of the Christian ilk. He was at the school of Tübingen in Germany, and he actually set out to write that book to disprove it. Now, at that point, you have a man that came to the evidence via the archaeological truthfulness of the book of Luke when he started, when he started out to uh, disprove the whole thing. John, I don't believe anybody living in the 20th century can prove or disprove what happened in the first century. Now, what we're saying is, the question is, is there the probability, is there evidence, just like is there evidence for believing that Abraham Lincoln lived? The question is, we could say, well, I've never seen Lincoln, but do we have evidence that would make the probability so that intellectually I could say, yes, this is an option that I should go with? I just don't think you can compare standards of truth 
1,900 years ago to standards of truth 100 years ago. And in terms of prophecies, Norman, isn't there a conspicuous prophecy in the book of Isaiah that when the Redeemer comes, we'll have a world of peace and nonviolence? I think the reason Jews have not been persuaded is not because they did or didn't have enough eyewitnesses, but because the kind of world which the Redeemer was supposed to usher in has been conspicuously absent. Well, let me share with you uh, the explanation uh, for that. The Old Testament predicts that the Messiah would come and suffer, Isaiah 53, mm -hmm. that they will look on him whom they've pierced, Zechariah 12, and it also predicts that he will come and reign and there'll be an era of perpetual peace. Now, the only way you can do both is to come and suffer and die, rise from the dead, and come back and set up that kingdom. That's our hope as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And that what guarantees the hope for us is that he fulfilled the first part of it, so we have every reason to look for the second part. Yes, but you see, what leaves a lot of people skeptical is that they're waiting for the second part. It's not very impressive that he fulfilled the prophecy that they would cast lots for his clothes when the major purpose of the Messiah was to bring about a world of peace and justice. But I think the hope that we have is guaranteed by the fact that the prophecies were fulfilled literally and accurately with regard to his dying. You can't both die and reign forever unless you come back to life. So we have every reason to believe the rest of them will be fulfilled because he did fulfill the first ones. We're still waiting. So are we. But we wait with evidence for waiting and with hope that it will come about by the God who created the universe and who has the power to bring it about.